Hi everybody, my name is Jane Clare and I'm the Education Resource Manager for ISQA. I'd like to welcome you all along today to our webinar, The Baylor Healthcare System Steep Journey with Dr. Ballard. Uh, we are delighted to have uh, Dr. David Ballard along with us today to go through the presentation um, and I really hope that there will be a lot of learning in it for our fellowship participants. So just to start off, I'm just going to say a few words about Dr. David Ballard by way of an introduction. Uh, he is Chief, Ex Chief Quality Officer for Baylor, Scott and White Health, the largest non-for-profit healthcare system in the state of Texas and one of the largest in the United States. Born from the 2013 combination of Baylor Healthcare System and Scott and White Healthcare, David joined Baylor Healthcare System in 1999 as its first Chief Quality Officer and was responsible for designing, implementing and evaluating initiatives related to clinical effectiveness, patient safety and other dimensions of healthcare quality improvement across the healthcare system. David is also past president of ISQA and we are very delighted and privileged to have him along today. Uh, so David, if you're there, I'm going to make you the presenter and then I will hand over to you for the rest of the presentation. Uh, and just before I do that, I just want to remind fellowship participants that there will be three questions within the presentation that they must answer in order to gain credits for watching the webinar. Thank you. David, are you there? Uh, good morning, uh, Jane, and uh, good morning to those of you uh, across the world who are uh, listening in. Uh, what, what I want to uh, discuss today, uh, uh, if, if you look at the uh, slide they've labeled the first slide, uh, what, what we'll cover is an overview, overview of the healthcare system for which I serve as a Chief Quality Officer, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the origin of the acronym STEEP, uh, how this connects to international quality frameworks, uh, talk about how our health care system uh, ha has become aligned over time to focus on delivering steep care, uh, talk about some infrastructure and tools, uh, and, and then provide uh, an example, and there's some other examples at the end of the slide deck that uh, we can look at if we have time uh, after the question, <clears throat> after questions and discussion. Uh, so, uh, Jane, uh, are, are, are we good for proceeding? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. So, uh, so Baylor Healthcare System uh, was started in 1905, and I, I, I you can read these slides faster than uh, than I can uh, uh, speak the words. But you know, basically, it's a uh, a regional healthcare system with uh, uh, hospitals, ambulatory care centers, uh, a, a number of other resources. Uh, historically, has not had a health plan. Uh, like many organizations in the United States related to the Accountable Care Act, uh, Baylor Healthcare System a couple of years ago developed an accountable care organization as a way to legally partner with affiliated but not employed physicians to uh, share savings related to uh, risk-based contracts for which there were uh, financial savings opportunities uh, if, if uh, quality metrics were achieved and cost metrics were also achieved. So uh, September 30th this past year, uh, Baylor uh, Healthcare System merged with Scott and White Health. And so the, the new organization has uh, about 43 hospitals, uh, about 34,000 employees, more than 6,000 affiliated physicians, and a new component to the merged organization is a health plan that Scott and White has managed since the 1970s. Uh, this this organization do, is involved with some research and teaching, but it's not uh, part of a medical school, and so it's, uh, it's a not-for-profit uh, organization on the one side, Legacy Baylor Healthcare System, an historic hospital-based organization that more recently has uh, engaged uh, uh, physicians through employment relationships, uh, and on the other side, uh, uh, Scott and White, which is an historic medical group practice model along the lines of, uh, of uh, perhaps the, the Mayo Clinic model that over time evolved into a healthcare system with hospitals and a health plan. So I, I want to move on to, to just introduce the acronym uh, STEEP. And, and the main point about this is that uh, 
what, what we're really talking about is how this organization over the last uh, nearly 15 years has, has very deliberately tried to align with a, uh, a, a national focus on health care quality. And, and the, the framing of this came through the Institute of Medicine Crossing the Quality Chasm. Uh, and in the uh, Crossing the Quality Chasm, there were six aims articulated for improvement that, that, that you can see here. Uh, those, those six aims were initially aligned in an, in an acronym by the Institute of Medicine that, uh, that I couldn't remember and a lot of my colleagues couldn't. So uh, I sat down with several folks across my organization in 2001 to think about how to put this together in a way that uh, at that time 20,000 employees might be able to uh, understand and embrace. And, and that led to uh, the, the, uh, this acronym STEEP to, to encompass all six of those dimensions, safety, timeliness, effectiveness, efficiency, equity, and patient-centeredness, and also uh, as, as depicted uh, in the image on the right to give a sense that to move from current state of healthcare quality to a future state really uh, required a steep climb to move from current care to ideal care. Uh, and then more, more recently, uh, the, the, I'm sure you're perhaps familiar with the triple aim in the United States articulated by uh, Don Berwick, uh, and certainly the, uh, the six dimensions of, of STEEP are, are closely connected with the, uh, with the three aims of better care for individuals, better health for populations, and reduction in per capita health care cost. So just, just to, to uh, make the point that the, the STEEP framework, while it's uh, one embraced by the Institute of Medicine of the United States in 2001, uh, it's, it's quite similar to those uh, uh, in, embraced in other countries. So, so the, uh, these uh, six priorities and three aims uh, of the United States uh, uh, re-articulated in, two, in 2011, so somewhat similar uh, in Australia. 2010, the safety and quality framework for healthcare, uh, the, those three dimensions, consumer centered, driven by information and organized for safety, certainly uh, safety very prominent in the uh, Australian framework. In, in Norway, uh, the national strategy for quality improvement for health and uh, care services, again, the uh, six aims articulated here. Uh, again, very very similar to the uh, the six aims of the Institute of Medicine, uh, uh, as as depicted in this slide, with the focus on effectiveness, safety, uh, engagement of users, coordination of care, utilization of resources appropriately, and and uh, uh, delivering health care uh, in an equitable manner. And then finally, the uh, UK uh, framework. Uh, under Lord Dar Darcy uh, in 2008 with a focus on safety, patient experience, and effectiveness. And then <clears throat> more recently, these uh, five domains as depicted in this slide, uh, uh, preventing uh, uh, premature deaths, enhancing the quality of life for people with long-term conditions, uh, focusing on a, 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 a recovery uh, from illnesses of care, ensuring that people have a positive experience with care, and then finally uh, uh, a focus on safety. So uh, perhaps the, the, the most important part of what I'm going to discuss today uh, w relates to, uh, given that, that one has a, a, a focus on aims, whether there are these six aims or other aims, uh, how do you align a very large and complex organization to focus on delivering those aims? So I, I'm going to uh, discuss some aspects of, of this and uh, parts of this that are of, of greater interest to you we can explore in more detail during the uh, question and answer period. So uh, our organization has a uh, board of trustees similar to uh, many uh, healthcare systems across the United States. Uh, our, our board has been very active in uh, a focus on quality. When I developed this strategic plan in 2000, there were three board members uh, on the committee that I chaired, uh, a subcommittee of our overall board, and, and they, uh, they put 
uh, uh, they articulated this resolution. And, and literally, I mean, just to give you a sense about how these things evolve, one of our board members at a meeting said to me, David, I, I think that if we have a resolution that all of our boards, as well as our hospital medical staffs, uh, endorse, I think that may help with alignment. Would it be okay if I came to the next meeting with a resolution? And I said, I think that would be a tremendous idea. And literally came back to the next meeting, written on a sheet of paper, a resolution that, that, that's uh, depicted in this slide. And, and just to underscore uh, the focus on the quality of care is given the highest priority in the planning, budgeting, and execution of all activities. Uh, and, and, I, and I can say that over the last 14 years, this has really been a, the guiding principle for our organization. Uh, uh, there were subsequent resolutions to focus on, on mortality reduction in, in 2005, as depicted by this slide. So the, the second point I want to make is, uh, uh, is, so it starts at a board level, and then um, how, how is management organized to achieve uh, the, these, uh, these goals? So uh, we created over time what we refer to as a steep governance council. And, and to underscore, this, this brings together clinical, operational, and financial leadership. Um, uh, I, I spent uh, eight years early in my career at Mayo Rochester, and the Steep Governance Council has, has some of the features, for example, of the Mayo Clinical Practice Committee that's been in place at, at Mayo for probably nearly 100 years. So the, there's an overall governance council. There's, there's uh, five working groups called Steep Subcommittees. Uh, these align with clinical service lines across our system. Uh, and and uh, uh, we, we, we take these, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the work of these subcommittees dock in very closely with the work of the clinical service lines. Uh, this is depicted in, in another way. I mean, just to give you a sense of, uh, of the people who are at the table, so to speak, um, our, our overall leadership of the Steep Governance Council, the chief quality officer of the system chairs this group. Uh, also serving on that is the chief medical officer, a, a executive who oversees all of our hospitals, the chief nursing officer. Uh, we also have a, 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 chief, a chief financial officer who, who uh, uh, serves on this committee and is a very important participant. The physician head of our physician group and then uh, over the last couple of years, as I shared with you, we've had an accountable care organization and the president of the Camel Care Organization is one of the seven voting members of the Steep Governance Council. So uh, depicted here are these five working groups, and to sort of be clear about this, these five working groups actually preceded uh, the, the, the creation overall of the Steep Governance Council. Uh, we, we've had a patient safety working group since about uh, uh, 2005, a clinical excellence group since about 2008. Uh, the efficiency group really uh, evolved around the same time as the Steep Governance Council. We've had an equity population health uh, working group since about 2005, uh, and a patient centeredness patient experience group since about that time. So uh, one, one comment in terms of departures from, from a, a, uh, uh, a uh, direct implementation of, of these of groups linked to these six aims. Candidly, we, we, we thought that timeliness apply across many of these areas, but it, it focused uh, perhaps most closely in the areas of clinical effectiveness, such as uh, oh, time to initial antibiotic for individuals with community-acquired pneumonia, uh, timing for antibiotics uh, initiation for uh, surgical procedures or termination within 24 hours following the surgical procedure, or for example, uh, for patients presenting with uh, acute myocardial infarction, timeliness with respect to uh, uh, percutaneous coronary interventions, or PCI. One other comment in terms of efficiency, so you know, if one reads the Cross Inequality uh, Chasm for uh, the Institute of Medicine 2001 publication, it's clear that its focus is on um, on waste reduction. To, to engage our chief financial officer, we also found that uh, 
it would be very important to look at the financial impact of, uh, of our improvement efforts. And, and I can talk about this in, in some more detail uh, in, in the question period. But the, the, the point is that there's many, many opportunities to improve healthcare quality. And if one looks at the entire distribution of those opportunities, uh, one, one cannot implement all of, all of those opportunities at one time. And so we also look at those opportunities through the lens of the, of the financial performance of, of our own organization. So this group looks at clinical waste reduction, but it also looks at the financial impact uh, uh, with respect to all of our potential quality improvement initiatives. Uh, our, our equity group um, ha has a very robust agenda uh, that, 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 that's certainly evolving. Uh, uh, from initially a focus on uh, potential disparities in hospital care to uh, uh, population health and, uh, and reducing disparities uh, across the entire spectrum of care. And then we have the patient-centeredness group that uh, uh, has a very robust agenda, and we can talk about that in uh, more detail. Uh, but one example is this group is very focused on uh, advancing shared decision-making and informed decision-making. The aligned entities here are really quite important. Uh, so, so across all of these areas for support, we have a, a training program that we refer to as our steep care improvement training program. This is modeled based on the uh, Intermountain Healthcare uh, uh, mini advanced training program. Uh, Brent James helped us to develop this program in 2004. We've trained uh, more than 1,500 uh, employees and aligned physicians in our uh, basic 50-hour face-to-face rapid cycle improvement program. Uh, all of our uh, from all of our supervisors, from directors up to our CEO, uh, are are required to. Uh, early in their employment in the organization to have this training. We also have a system-wide analytics group that we refer to as our steep measurement analytics and reporting group. <coughs> uh, amongst the things that this group does is it helps to prioritize the areas of focus for these subcommittees. So for example, this group has done a great deal of work looking at where are our preventable mortality opportunities in concert with the Patient Safety Committee, and then directing our focus to those areas. And, and then the, 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 the clinical service lines uh, connect in uh, very closely to this work. Uh, so leadership is important. Uh, uh, in this, this slide is really just to say that we're, we're pretty formative in, a, in our leadership roles. We didn't have a system chief medical officer until 2006 didn't have a system chief nursing officer until 2007. So, so this leadership structure has evolved over time. So one uh, uh, Im important component of our ability to uh, align 20,000 employees to focus on delivering steep care is, uh, is we, we have organizational goals, people, quality, service, and finance. Uh, those are our four organizational pillars. Uh, in this organization, there's been a long history of compensation at risk related to performance. When I came in 1999, there had been a 20-year history from 1980 to 1999 of compensation, even in a not-for-profit environment, focused on our fiscal operating margin. Several, several of the board members who worked with me on the committee that I chaired in 2000 felt that we needed to have uh, compensation linked to other goals. And out of that, uh, we, we evolved to having uh, these, these broader set of goals across these four pillars uh, and compensation linked to uh, e each one of these goals. So in, in addition to about, so about 5% of our employees at the director level and above having compensation at risk related to, for example, uh, our, our, our patient satisfaction scores, uh, goals related to patient satisfaction. Every employee has, has goals that, that are aligned with these, these system level goals and their annual merit compensation is based on 
their performance relative to those goals. So, so just to, to, to finish that, I think this system alignment is really critical uh, uh, as, as a starting point. Without it, I believe it's very difficult to, uh, to advance uh, a, 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 a commitment to quality across a very complex organization such as ours. So in terms of infrastructure and, stool, and, and tools for steep care, uh, so, so I mentioned the uh, steep academy. Again, this is very similar to the mini ATP program, mini advanced training program that uh, Brent James pioneered at Intermountain Healthcare. So uh, we, we typically uh, teach the basic course in multidisciplinary groups of about 25 to 30 people who focus on solving a problem uh, in their area of day-to-day -day work. Uh, as you might expect, we have many other ways of delivering this information. For example, we might uh, have a, uh, a sort of uh, just-in-time uh, training for a, a team that's working on a particular problem. Uh, we, we might, uh, after a change in shift on a nursing floor, <coughs> have, uh, have the uh, nurses who just rotated off do a uh, uh, a, a, a very uh, brief uh, uh, one-hour uh, uh, update on, on these tools. We also have uh, system-level uh, coaches who, who are resources for, for people across the organization in addition to uh, individuals who are referred to as healthcare improvement directors, typically people with a background in nursing, in some cases medicine or other clinical areas who have an MBA, who have very deep training in uh, uh, process improvement in healthcare and lead that work within our hospitals and clinics. So, so this just provides a little bit more detail about the, um, uh, about the Steep Academy training and more than 32,000 employees and 250 external customers have been trained to date. Electronic health records are, are an important uh, part of what we do. Uh, certainly our early work in uh, steep care uh, didn't have the benefit of, of associated electronic health record deployment, but uh, uh, we, we very carefully align our electronic health record uh, tactics and, and uh, implementation efforts with, with our focus on, on delivering steep care. Uh, I, I shared with you this uh, uh, previously this work of this analytics group, our steep measurement analytics and reporting group. Uh, so, so again, we're a system uh, uh, roughly uh, uh, today about uh, 34,000 employees. There's about 30 FTEs of analysts who, who work in this area across the system. Uh, and uh, th their, their historic work has, has involved value-based purchasing. Uh, some core, core measure work, clinical preventive service delivery focus, and uh, a, a focus on uh, guiding our efforts to reduce hospital mortality. Uh, this, this, here, this slide here just depicts some examples of our uh, steep uh, clinical and financial outcomes areas of focus, uh, a, a common pneumonia order set, a, a, a focus on uh, heart failure care, uh, enabled uh, in part through a, a system-wide order set. Uh, some, some work related to the financial and non-financial cost of electronic health records. Uh, and then finally, uh, some work with transitional care for heart failure, uh, evaluated in an advanced practice nurse-led uh, care transition program. So to uh, uh, to, to move on, uh, I, I wanted to share a, a specific example so, so uh, you can have a sense of you know, how does this really work in action, how do we actually operationalize this. So we have an, efficient, uh, uh, an, an efficiency group that focuses on operational excellence, business restructuring, clinical restructuring, uh, as, as shown here. We uh, uh, had had initial area of uh, effort by this group related to uh, the uh, design and implementation of standardized order sets. Our first order set was community acquired pneumonia uh, across the system. Our second order set was uh, uh, heart failure. 
So w we uh, observed that uh, approximately six or seven years ago, we had more than 60 order sets across our system for heart failure. Uh, this led to a situation, for example, on a hospital floor where there, there might be 10 patients on a floor with heart failure. Uh, there might even be 10 different order sets. So for the nurse caring for the patient in the middle of the night, the question wasn't so much the patient's condition, but uh, who is the physician and what order set did they use. So we moved on to develop a standardized order set for heart failure. Uh, we we uh, had a multidisciplinary team, used the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association guidelines. Uh, we uh, uh, built this upon, uh, at that time, we'd had about 2,000 individuals trained in rapid cycle improvement. We also had uh, a lot of experience with dissemination of performance data, both uh, 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 at the hospital and physician level, unblinded use of the order set. For, so for example, uh, early on in this rollout, in the lounges in our hospitals where, where physicians uh, and, and other clinicians would, would spend time, we would post at the physician level the percentage of that physician's patients who, uh, for whom the order set had been used. Uh, we also message this in uh, other ways at our medical staff uh, uh, leadership meetings, at our hospital board meetings, in addition to providing individual physician feedback. So we were able to achieve over a nine-month period across 10 acute care hospitals, 95% uh, use of this order set. So we went from 60 order sets to one order set and at nine months, 95% use of that one order set. We observed a 51% decrease in in-hospital mortality, a nearly $2,000 decrease in total direct cost of care, and uh, in a paper that we published in the uh, uh, ISQA journal in 2010, uh, when these findings <coughs> were extrapolated nationally across the United States, uh, this translated into an annual reduction in in-hospital deaths of 15,000 and uh, a reduction of hospital cost annually nationally across the United States of $2 billion if uh, such an order set could be implemented uh, across the United States. So to uh, uh, conclude before we move to uh, questions, the uh, commitment from quality improvement starts at the highest level of leadership. So our, our board is extremely uh, committed to quality improvement, extremely focused and, and knowledgeable. Uh, all of our board members have been trained in rapid cycle process improvement. Several of our board members teach uh, the leadership component of our rapid cycle process improvement. Our chief executive officer uh, is, is very focused on quality improvement. Uh, he's, he's committed to uh, training all of our leaders and uh, uh, our directors and above are, uh, are uh, uh, required to go through basic training in quality improvement in healthcare. Uh, and, and our uh, CEO uh, messages this on a, on a regular basis and uh, at, at a business level our annual performance-based compensation if, a, if an individual hasn't uh, gone through this, this training who uh, was required to go through this training, that person does not receive their annual uh, compensation related to performance. Uh, the, I, I shared with you our, our work around the infrastructure for this. I, I think this uh, <coughs> overall approach with the uh, uh, chief uh, financial officer, the uh, uh, executive overseeing all of our hospitals, in addition to our clinical leadership, chief nursing officer, chief medical officer, head of our employed physician group, our accountable care organization at the table is, is really critical uh, to, to uh, help uh, guide this effort and to make sure that the work is adequately resourced. 
uh, we, we work very closely uh, uh, with both employed as well as other physicians and our, our accountable care organization uh, today has been a vehicle for accelerating this. Um, we've, uh, and perhaps I, I, I can uh, discuss this in some detail in the, in the question period to provide some examples, but the accountable care organization uh, has, has provided a, a, a business framework for engaging affiliated but, but not employed physicians that was not legally available to us prior to the Accountable Care Act. Uh, and, and to uh, the, the final point perhaps here is to say that you know everything changes in, in health care and uh, uh, our, our work is very formative and uh, uh, it's taken us 14 years to, to uh, develop uh, to where we are today and uh, we uh, we're, we're continuing to evolve in terms of, uh, of trying to uh, be able to engage in the uh, delivery of uh, safe, timely, effective, efficient, equitable, and patient-centered care uh, as, as, uh, to be able to do that as, as efficiently as possible. So uh, we have some questions for the fellows. Uh, uh, Jane, uh, uh, did, uh, uh, did, did you want to say anything about these questions? Uh, no, it was just to say really that uh, if you wanted to claim your credit points for taking part in the webinar, um, that you should answer these three questions um, and you'll be able you will be able to know whether and how uh, whether or not you were paying attention um, and just to get some feedback really on the overall webinar. So, so in, in Jane, did, did you? Uh, and, and is there a, uh, a structured opportunity to respond to these questions? Absolutely, writing? absolutely. Uh, if, if you respond to the questions when you submit your fellowship credit points, or you can respond to the questions also in our fellowship forum. So, Jane, all that I see right now is my slides. I, I don't see the, the the webinar icon. So. Um, uh, so as we move into to questions, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think I'll need you to pose them for me. That's no problem at all. Uh, we have a few in at the moment. Uh, um, and, and so, 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 so before we segue on, I'll just say mm -hmm. uh, here. And so, Jane, will the slide deck be available for uh, for uh, viewing or downloading? Absolutely, it will. Yes, it'll be available after the webinar. Oh, okay, and just to say, we, we've listed some of the uh, uh, our, our published work on on this journey, uh, and uh, uh, I'd be happy to be a resource for other information that you you might be seeking. Super. Okay. Thank you very much, David. Uh, we'll make a start on the questions. We just have a few in. Uh, firstly, is the Steep Academy open to non non employees of Baylor Healthcare? Oh uh, yes, it uh, and and we've. Uh, We've trained about um, about 350 to 400 people in our basic uh, sort of 50-hour curriculum uh, in uh, through the Steep Academy. We've uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, for example, in the state of Pennsylvania, we went there and trained uh, uh, personnel in two hospitals there related to a broader focus on quality improvement. We trained a group of uh, 30 people associated with Centaur in Virginia. We've also done some of this work internationally. Uh, uh, my, my wife's an Italian citizen. I'm fortunate to uh, be fluent in Italian, so I've, I've taught uh, a rapid cycle improvement in healthcare in Italian and a, a couple of venues in Italy. Super. Fantastic, David. That's great. Thank you for that. I might pass that individual's details on to you for more information, if that's okay. Yes. Um, Next question, what systems are in place for adverse events or incident notification? Organizations early on, we were involved with uh, voluntary reporting of adverse events. Uh, early on, probably about 14 years ago, we used a tool developed by David Schoken through his company, Dr. Quality. But you know, as many of you know, and as we covered in the ISQA meeting in Buenos Aires just a, 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 a month after 9-11, there's a, a voluntary reporting systems capture a very, very small percentage of harm in healthcare. 
uh, perhaps uh, three three percent or so. So we recognize the need to uh, also have, if you will, sort of an epidemiological surveillance of harm events. Uh, a starting point was the IHI Global Trigger Tool. Uh, our a leader of patient safety, Dr. Donald Kennerly, has uh, has spent a great deal of time uh, 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 improving the the, me the method to measure harm, as depicted in this slide here, 35. Uh, you, you can see he has a paper in the uh, Journal of pa Patient Safety, 2013, uh, uh, describing some of this work. Uh, uh, also, a, uh, uh, a, a an earlier paper in BMJ Quality and Safety, 2011, as well as a, a paper coming out in uh, uh, in Health Services Research, describing a five-year experience with this. So, so we we um, uh, uh, systematically measure harm through through uh, uh, an adverse event tool that uh, that that we've uh, uh, focused on over the last several years. For example, the Office of the Inspector General in the United States has found our tool to be useful and has used our tool for some uh, national level uh, adverse event uh, uh, measurement work. So our our adverse event tool, just to sort of summarize. A, we've been able to show that we can we can measure adverse events with the tool. We can design interventions to reduce adverse events. Uh, that concomitantly, with the reduction in adverse events, we've been able to demonstrate a reduction in hospital mortality, as well as a reduction in the cost for a hospital episode of care, and in the type of payment system we have for most of our hospital admissions. A a a diagnostic uh, 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 a group payment, DRG type payment, where we receive a set amount of money for a hospital episode of care. If we're able to reduce the cost for that episode of care, it improves our financial performance. So for example, our chief financial officer it, uh, it ha has been an extremely strong supporter of our adverse event tool development, not just because it helps to make our patients safer, safer, but it also improves our financial performance. Super. Thank you, David. Um, next question. At the early stages of the implementation of the quality improvement system, how do you manage staff buy-in? So uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So, and you know, there's staff at many different levels. So. Uh, so let's talk at one level, the, the level of, say, a, a hospital president, a hospital chief executive officer, who in our environment typically is not someone with a clinical care background. Um, so early on, when, when um, our board had that resolution from 2000, when we changed our uh, compensation program, so for example, uh, people's compensation related to things like um, the uh, performance of, uh, of core measures uh, for our patients hospitalized, say, with, with heart attacks, <clears throat> I literally had hospital presidents say to me, David, I can't influence, for example, how rapidly we recognize and treat pneumonia, or I can't really influence whether or not we get someone's artery open in 90 minutes who has a heart attack. That's really a doctor issue. And so the message in 2000, 2001 is your job has actually changed. Your job isn't just about uh, producing financial results at the hospital level. Your, your job is about all four of those pillars, including quality and service and people and finance. And, and so there, there was this, uh, this resetting of expectations. Uh, at, at the level of a hospital president, a chief operating officer, a chief nurse, well, the, 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 the nurses and the clinicians always had, had understood that, uh, that these clinical aspects of care were their responsibility. So, so one, one resetting of expectations for staff was to say that uh, uh, this is the job of 20,000 people uh, and, and this, is, this is our new work. Um, and that's certainly also reflected in uh, to, to individualize this, in 2000, we didn't have explicit goals for each of our employees. Today, in 2014, 
I can go into uh, a, 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 a system-wide online resource. I can look at our chief executive officer's annual goals this year. I can look at my goals. I can look at the goals of people who report to me. I can look at the goals of anyone in the organization and see how they're aligned with, with uh, the, uh, the overall system goals and service quality people in finance. Super. Thanks again, David. Um, the second part of the, that question is related to it. Uh, have you ever had to make trade-offs between quality improvement initiatives and the cost of implementation? So, so that's a, a great question. Uh, and I, uh, uh, I, I mentioned work with an advanced practice nurse, uh, and, and so uh, uh, Jane, just are, we're, we're still in the slides, are we? Absolutely, we are. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if we look at uh, on 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 slide twenty-five on the far right, this advanced practice nurse-led transitional care program. So, many of you may recognize this is uh, uh, the the uh, model of Dr. Mary Naylor at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, her her work involves. Uh, advanced practice nurses interacting with hospitals within a uh, hospital episode, interacting with patients in a hospital episode of care, having eight home visits over 90 days for those patients. So we were able to show for people admitted with heart failure to one of our community hospitals <coughs> that this model had huge impact on, uh, on, on, on readmissions. Uh, 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 we, we also uh, were able to show that it improved patient satisfaction. But uh, the, the, uh, the, the last bullet here, though, uh, this, this cost of, uh, the, the cost of this program, given the way we're currently paid, uh, can't be scaled across every admission. So what we're trying to do now is to identify the patients at highest risk for care transition difficulties, uh, for readmissions, those at high, highest risk for difficulty, for example, with uh, um, uh, medication reconciliation. And we're, we're, we're focusing the highest intensity of resources on those patients at the level of, for example, home visits. And so, you know, what, what might you find in a home visit? We found an uh, 80-year-old woman who'd been repeatedly hospitalized who had 120 different medications at home. She really had no idea of what she was supposed to be taking. Uh, we also found she had heart failure and was on a low salt diet, had a number of, uh, uh, a large part of her diet was through canned foods and she, she uh, on her shelf at home, she had very high sodium canned foods and she, she had no idea about the, the salt content of those foods. So those sorts of things, uh, we, we only discovered through a home visit. In, in other cases, for patients who, who are at somewhat lower risk for care transition difficulties, we might use a less intensive resource, such as a telephone follow-up and, um, and, and monitoring to, for example, make sure that a primary care visit has happened within a week of hospital discharge. Super. Thanks, very, thanks for that again, David. Um, well, I, I might just make one other comment. Yes, so, absolutely. So, I wasn't sure so, if you're so, finished. So, so, so let's let's kind of talk about. Okay, so you know, what's an end of one of a difficult conversation that we had? Well, uh, so through the Steep Governance Council, we um, evaluated our relationship with a cardiovascular screening ban. It's about six years ago. Uh, one of our hospital executives was observing, like is the case for many hospitals across the United States, decline in hospital admissions. We had a lot of empty hospital beds, and there was interest in how we might fill those hospital beds. So <clears throat> without very much clinical input, without sort of the benefit of this uh, steep governance council oversight, <clears throat> we developed a relationship with a screening van to uh, basically uh, in neighborhoods across Dallas, Fort Worth, screen patients for cardiovascular disease, vascular disease, cerebrovascular disease. And over a couple of year period, we certainly uh, generated some screen positive patients for subsequent uh, diagnostic testing and hospitalization and surgery. 
One of the difficulties, though, was that was implemented without uh, before we created the Steep Governance Council Oversight Group. Uh, and it turns out that almost all of the practices promoted by that screening ban were not supported by evidence. Uh, specifically, for example, the uh, uh, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force uh, uh, rated many of those practices as causing more harm than good. Well, when that contract was up for renewal about a year ago, we then had in place the Steep Governance Council at the table. We did have the chief financial officer, the person overseeing the hospitals, but we also had the chief nursing officer, chief medical officer, chief quality officer. So that group reviewed the evidence, and despite the fact that uh, the screening van activity was very financially favorable for our hospitals, uh, we, we decided not to renew that contract because we thought it was uh, 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 harmful for patients and it, and it was a, um, a waste of, uh, of resources at a population level, even though in terms of our fiscal operating margin it was favorable. Super. Thanks for that, David. Um, next question. How far is your organization with the implementation of the AAA framework, and how is this aligned with steep operations? So, uh, I, uh, you know, I think for, for all of us, this is, this is uh, a journey. I would say there's a great deal of synergy between the, uh, the six aims of the Institute of Medicine and the AAA framework. I, I, I think uh, uh, delivering steep care uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, highly aligned with, uh, with those three aims. I would say that uh, uh, you, you may, may notice in, the, um, in, in this depiction <coughs> of, the, of the steep governance council subcommittees and aligned entities, one of the movements to, to focus more on the triple aim is explicitly uh, having, so, so we have a uh, chief medical officer for our accountable care organization who also is our vice president for population health and equity. And through that role, we, 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 we certainly uh, think more broadly about uh, population health. I, I would say one of the other things that's moving us in this direction, the Dallas-Fort Worth marketplace, historically there's been very little uh, uh, capitated care arrangements uh, in, in, the, in the private sector. We're, we're uh, moving uh, more in the direction of at-risk care contracts, and one of, one of the motivations for our merger with Scott and White was their 40-year experience with the health plan uh, and, and their competencies that have, uh, that have developed uh, through uh, their experience with that health plan, their, their population health competencies. Super. Thanks, David. There was just a, a short second half to that question, and it was, what population health measures do you track? So, uh, uh, one, one example, um, th there's, there's an area that we describe, an initiative we describe in our book, uh, the Diabetes Health and Wellness Institute. So, this area is in the poorest, most violent part of Dallas. Uh, just, just to, to give you a sense of this, I mean, this is an area where uh, when we were trying to uh, 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 set up this clinic, uh, we literally had to have a conference call with the two gang leaders for the Crips and the Bloods in that community to determine where our community health workers could safely visit people they were trying to serve in that community. Uh, well, with the motivation for, for that resource uh, in East Dallas was we recognized that of all the zip codes that we serve, that, that zip code had the highest percentage uh, of, of uh, preventable emergency room visits and preventable admissions. And so we, 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 tr we track um, <coughs> uh, the, the, in that community, for example, we've tracked preventable emergency room visits. and through things, so, so the elements of that program include, uh, we have a community garden uh, 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 there, we have a, a safe place for people to exercise in a community that has the highest violent crime rate, rate in Dallas, 
We have, a, we have kitchens there uh, and staff to train people in that community in, in, in how to prepare healthy foods. We have these community health workers who visit patients in the community. Uh, we also have uh, nurses. Actually, there's actually only one, one uh, physician because <coughs> this is not a sort of primary medical model concept. But uh, so, so in, in that particular example, we, we've shown over time a decline in emergency room visits, a decline in, uh, 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 in uh, preventable hospital admissions for people from that zip code. You know, I would say that there certainly are, are data, qual data challenges around uh, population health, for example, uh, information about the total cost of care for serving that community. It's, it's extremely difficult to, uh, to, to have that type of information given the, uh, the, 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 the various uh, uh, entities that, that, uh, uh, that have that cost information. Uh, for example, uh, the state Medicaid, uh, Medicare databases, other databases. So, so it's certainly challenging, uh, I think, related to the insights from the person who asked this question around the, the metrics and population health. But at a, at a very pragmatic level for that community, we focused on uh, uh, preventable emergency room visits, preventable hospital uh, admissions. Super. Thank you, David. Uh, fascinating insight there. Um, down to our last question, and it is, how would our organization request this type of training from Baylor? Yes, yeah, so um, you, could, uh, you could email me, or if you go to our website, uh, you, you can also, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Nanette Myers. So, so uh, we, uh, so we have a group that we created about uh, two years ago that uh, is is known as the Steep Global Institute, and that's that's a, a group of people in our organization who focus exclusively on assisting other organizations outside of Baylor Scott and White Health. You, you can appreciate that. Uh, individuals who are embroiled in our day-to-day -day operations, that they're, they're going to have difficulty, for example, uh, shifting their efforts to think about how, how to, uh, how to uh, work with a healthcare delivery organization, for example, in, uh, in, in France. And so, so what we've done is we've created through the Steep Global Institute uh, a, 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 a NIDAS, a place where we can uh, take our insights, lessons learned, and bring them to other organizations. Um, and and we, uh, you know, we found that very rewarding. We, we've also, uh, uh, you know, we, we've, we've, learned, we've learned from that. And, uh, uh, and, and we do it also through, through a variety of other mechanisms. So for example, a past president of ISC was uh, Enrique Ruelas, who's a close friend of mine. Enrique is the healthcare quality leader in Mexico, and uh, Enrique has sent uh, physicians from Mexico to spend three months a uh, period of time with us to uh, uh, deeply engage what we do, and and for example, um, uh, our um, our uh, Steep Academy basic curriculum was translated into Spanish by uh, one of uh, Enrique's protégés, Arturo Martinez, and Arturo has extensively taught rapid cycle improvement uh, in Spanish with the curriculum somewhat adjusted for the uh, uh, Mexican healthcare experience. We also have uh, taken our, our patient safety harm measurement tool, translated that into Spanish, and that's been applied in hospitals in, in, in Mexico. So, so the, the, there's a uh, there's opportunities to, to come to Dallas with a group of people for training. There's opportunities for uh, uh, intense, uh, perhaps three months training or, or, or longer for a particular leader. And, and we, we also uh, uh, work uh, on site uh, elsewhere in the United States, elsewhere in the world uh, with other organizations. Super. Thank you very much, David. Uh, that brings us to the end of the questions that have come in.
I would just like to say to our fellowship participants, if there are any additional questions for David, if they just want to email them into myself, um, and I will pass them on to David, if that's all right with you, David. Yes, and, and I'd just like to say I'm sorry for the technical difficulties at, at my end uh, er, early on. I, I hope that uh, that uh, uh, despite those early difficulties, uh, you were able to uh, uh, view the information and uh, and uh, hear uh, what I had to say. Uh, and uh, there's much more detail uh, in other parts of this slide deck that I. I uh, wanted to share with you but, but didn't want to spend all of our time just looking at slides and so there, there may be some other questions that arise uh, when you have a chance to uh, review the rest of the information in the slide deck and of course this <coughs> excuse me this this information is is also covered in in much more detail uh, it, uh, this reference one this achieving steep healthcare book uh, that was published in 2013 describes our experience in, in much more detail. Uh, we we uh, related to this book. Uh, I've spent a fair amount of my time visiting with organizations in the U.S. and el elsewhere and, and talking, discussing this journey. Uh, and and so the the book really explicitly is meant to be a communication device uh, to to, uh, to to begin to to uh, share our experiences with other organizations uh, so that uh, they may think about how they would like to approach these problems. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I appreciate the time with you today and uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to me or if you look at the Steep Global Institute website, Nanette Myers, uh, her information is on that website uh, and, and she, she uh, would, would be happy to uh, uh, help uh, work with you to define what your specific needs might be and, and, and how we can address those. Super. Listen, thank you so much again, David. That was a fascinating presentation. Uh, and as always, we learned uh, an additional, uh, there's an additional contribution from the participants through the questions. So I'd like to thank you for your time today. Thank you for your time in, in preparation for, uh, for the webinar. And I'd also like to wish you well for the rest of the day. Uh, thank you, and I, I look forward to uh, seeing folks uh, at the ne next ISQA uh, annual meeting in Brazil. Super, super. We'll catch up then, David. Listen, thank you very much. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye.